right. Thank you, everybody, for tuning in once again to another episode of Aftershocks TV right here on the CMS Network. And today we got a couple of old school metal vets with me You're here to talk about their stoner doom metal outfit, Cassius King, who just released their outstanding sophomore full length, Dread the Dawn. It's out now on Nomad Eel Records. We've got guitarist Dan Lorenzo and vocalist Jason McMaster with us. Gentlemen, thanks for coming on Aftershocks. How are you guys? Thank you, Matt. Thanks for having us. Absolutely. Absolutely, guys. Well, before we get into talking about the new album, Dread the Dawn, um, and considering that the band's first record field trip was put out while we were still in the throes of the pandemic, I just want to give the viewers and listeners a quick little background on how the two of you guys came together to initially form Cassius King prior to field trip uh, when that came back out in the summer of uh, 2021 when that came out. Did you guys know each other uh, previously from the Watchtower Hades days back in the 80s? Or, Dan, did you simply just reach out to Jason and recruit him, kind of like you did with some of the other guys in the other projects you've done recently? Well, you know, we knew of each other for sure. We knew each other's names. Um, I'm going to be honest. I'm not a big Watchtower fan. That's not my kind of music. But, um, you know, Jason said we met in uh, 1993 in Austin or 1992, which I only learned that this week during these types of interviews. Mm -hmm. But, um, you know, I've been throwing this name around. This shirt is literally 25 years old or more. Wow. Um, I've been using that name for my first solo album. And um, mm -hmm. I was doing some cover songs. I love recording cover songs and making them just a little bit heavier than the original. And I worked with a few different singers, Rob Dukes, and one of my favorite guys to work with was Jason. So I think um, it was right during the coronavirus shutdown where we decided, uh, hey, man, I got a whole bunch of you know songs left over. I finished the new Vessel of Light album. And I still got tons of material and I was still writing. And I told uh, some interviewer last night that the song, uh, 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 oh, Jason, please help me. The first video from our Cleopatra's Needle, that was actually called My Corona when I first wrote it. That was the oh, template. Okay. <laughs> so, yeah, but I, I love what Jason did. We did some covers. You should hear him sing Mr. Speed by Kiss. Just crushes it. And uh, we thought, you know, let's Thanks, find these originals together. No. Yeah. Fantastic. Thanks for that, Dan. Oh, you're welcome. <laughs> the uh, the connection between Hades and Watchtower was through me and Alan uh, Tecchio, uh, Hades singer. We're pen pals. Uh, Alan wrote to basically the the PO box, which was you know the the Watchtower fan club address. Mm -hmm. And I got the letter and uh, we started back and forth and he sent me the first Hades record. He sent me a t-shirt. I just, I just saw that t-shirt yesterday in my closet. It It's just way too bright green for me to wear. I mean, it's like, <laughs> it's like emerald green. It would be hard for me to wear. And, and uh, it's probably the size of a dish rack by now too. <laughs> um, but, you know, I, I appreciated we were kind of fanboying out on each other's band. And and of course, that would probably be other than in fanzines and stuff. That would probably be the first time I saw uh, Dan Lorenzo's name um, and me being a fan of Hades and, and, and anybody who's ever been in Hades, uh, I have respect for uh, it seems to be a good a good club. And um when I, the irony is thick here. Uh, I like to jest and say, uh, when Alan, uh, as per my suggestion, um, joined Watchtower when I left Watchtower to, to do the Dangerous Toys thing. Mm -hmm. uh, and, and then here we are decades later, me, you know, working with, hey, he's working with Watchtower members. I'm working with Hades members. I just, I find it odd and quite funny, actually. So there's some uh, trading, baseball card, singer trading <laughs> going on, right? Nice. <laughs> yeah, absolutely. Cool, man. Well, yeah, so let's get into Dread the Dawn. I mean, the first thing I, I noticed, you know, when I was listening to it was that you guys, I mean, definitely raised the bar production-wise in this record. I mean, it's such a great mix where the music and vocals are just so completely symmetrical and just... They really blend so nicely together. It's just really just top-notch production. What did you do really differently on this record compared to Field Trip in terms of the production to really get this amazing sound that we're hearing on Dread the Dawn? It's something we don't like to discuss, and it's kind of a, sort of a secret, but we talked mm. about it last night for only the first time. 
We did nothing differently. Nothing. 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 No, really. No, the wow. it, to in, in my um, if I may, in my eyes and ears, it's a consistency that that never like. You know, we we wrote you know th these songs for you know well, that's enough to make a record. Okay, well then Dan doesn't stop. He's like a shark. He doesn't stop writing or swimming. You pick, and so he just keeps on writing. So you know, yay, field trip is out. Hey Jason, I'm sending you some new songs. Okay, <laughs> all, all right, go ahead. Um, J Rod, the uh, John, the 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 engineer producer on this dude, he's he's a master uh he knows exactly what to do with uh with dan's riffs uh you know uh jimmy's bass and ron's drums he knows exactly what to do and i think that once i got my stuff figured out over here and and the the sort of like uh timber of vocal stylings that work best over dan's riffs uh, and started sending stuff directly to J Rod. It's, it's, it was kind of like just another day at the office. So here we are, two records in. The consistency is, is, is the same. I, I'm not exactly. If you hear Matt, if you hear stuff that's different about uh, Dread the Dawn compare in comparison to Field Trip, we should call J Rod because I don't really don't think that he did anything different. I just think that. Uh, everybody he's involved with is just keeping him so busy. He's just getting better at what he what he's doing. Okay, but he mixes. He does. I asked him what kind of like vocal chain he has set up for me. Mm -hmm. I feel like he uses the same vocal chain for for all of his vocals that are sent to him. I think that he does the exact same thing. I just think that you know uh, the. You know the I'm I don't sound like anybody. You know what I mean. Every everybody mm -hmm. has their own uh, fingerprint. So, mm -hmm. um, but I'm glad that you you think that it's different. That how I if I also may throw into the mix, the songwriting didn't really really change either. Maybe you just like these. Like I'm interviewing you now, Matt. Maybe you just <laughs> like these songs better. No. Well, you know, I mean, I think what it is is just more so maybe I think on Field Trip, and like I said, it wasn't like I'm, I'm saying Field Trip was was not a, a, a solid production record. I just think really, I guess maybe it's the mix that's maybe to me a little better with, with the vocals and the music. I think maybe, I think the vocals were really out in front. on the, Not really out in front, but a little more out in front, I should say, on mm -hmm. the last record compared to now where I think it just kind of blends in, you know, really just perfectly. Um, and uh, it's yeah, so just funny, Matt. Yeah. everybody has a different opinion, like, and we hear completely mm. opposite of what some things you've said. So, yeah, we just kind of throw up our hands, like, we don't feel like we're doing anything differently. I mean, there was no goals to make a better record, and we got to be it just here's some more, here's 10 more songs, in my opinion, you know, nothing crazy. Mm -hmm. Yeah, it's, it's yeah. interesting though. I, I like that, I like that Matt feels like, yeah. Uh, the mix is better because that's a, that's a positive. But at the same time, you and I are sitting here going, "I wonder what he's hearing that we're not hearing." <laughs> it's interesting, you yeah. know. It could be. Let this kind of goes what Dan just said. You know, what are you listening to the record on? What brand of headphones? What 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 you, what speaker that's setup do you have? Mm -hmm. What you know? It just depends on. But but then you might be right. You're making me. I'm not second guessing field trip. I'm just saying you. You may be right by way of uh, because, you know, I do recall maybe uh, and it's all fractured memories, but, uh, you know, maybe Jimmy saying the vocals are too loud on this part or they're not loud enough on this part or I and we, I will we agree. never say that. We never say that, Jason. <laughs> we well, always say, we've never said they're, they're not loud enough. I don't think J Jimmy and I would never say that in all honesty. Well, See, sometimes I have this weird thing about my vocals. They need to like fit mm -hmm. the part of the song. Mm -hmm. uh, if they're too loud, I'm gonna say that's too loud, you know. Or if uh, if these guys will suggest, I feel like the vocal part that's happening in this section the second time around. Why did you leave it out the first time? Because we love this. It should happen every mm -hmm. time. Mm -hmm. And uh, you know, I feel like. Uh, 
you know, if you give away your best party trick at the when there's only 10 people in the room and then they say they you know then you have then you you run out of tricks you know don't don't give don't give the song away too soon uh was was that was all that kind of a thing was mm -hmm. and then there's and then there's the idea where uh you know maybe maybe it does need to be turned up a little bit but i don't remember there being any kind of like uh Oh my God, J. Rod, what are you doing? The vocals are too loud. You know, nothing. Mm -hmm. That's just an example, and it that never happens. Mm -hmm. But maybe you're onto something that that I just feel like J. Rod's getting better at what he does. I mean, we listen to the song, and go, "Yep, that's a killer. It sounds killer." Next, mm -hmm. it, we don't spend a whole lot of time yeah. worrying about what what's going to happen because I just feel like everyone's wearing their hat. You know, we're we're used mm -hmm. to each other now. It's like maybe we got field trip under our belt and now we have this second record and it was just like we kept going so the the uh production crew you know band and j-rod and how we're sending files and stuff is working better just because we know what to expect of each other sure well whatever j-rod's doing he just needs to keep it up because like i said it's, there you go. it's excellent uh so yeah so musically now you know similar obviously to the first record but again I, I just feel like there's there's a, a a level of tightness on this record that's just you know is better you know which would make sense I think because the three of you Dan I know you Jimmy and Ron I mean correct me if I'm wrong but between the three of you I mean this would I think mark the fourth record you guys have done in like the last three years or so right between the two Vessel Light records and now the two Cassius Kings correct um, right correct. so you yeah. could tell that you guys really have recorded together extensively um, yeah. I mean, so even though you guys have played with each other, obviously for some time, you know, back, you know, back some time with Hades. I, I mean, has the last three records, in your opinion, has, well, I should say, four records in the last three years, have these recordings that you put out? Has that really brought sort of maybe uh, you guys once again, as Jason was alluding to, with J. Rod getting better and better, just because he's, you know, just oh, working with you guys. I'm definitely my guitar playing gets worse every year, so I got to write some <laughs> simplistic songs. Jimmy too. Jimmy's like, we're both like, oh man, I have this weird French pronounced thing that. I have tremendous pain from here to here. I'm trying to get rid of it just mm. the last few months. I put off going to a doctor for years. I finally went to a doctor about a month ago and I got to do these, you know, uh, exercises that I pretty much forget how to do. But so I don't know if you know this, if I told you this the last time we spoke when I was about to release the Patriarchs and Black album, but the last four, five, six albums I've done, I do everything first to a click track, which is mm. not at all the way we used to do things 30 years ago. So I almost can finish an album or at least certainly finish four or five songs before Ron even starts to play drums. So maybe, maybe I'm getting better with the click. Mm, and, okay. you know, so it's, it, I, I play the whole album pretty much, or, you know, most of the guitar parts and then Ron comes in then then Jason, then Jimmy. So, um, you know, I guess you could say, Oh, we've been playing together so long. Me, myself, Ron, uh, Ron Lipnicki and Jimmy Shulman that we're getting tighter but we haven't even jammed together in two years. We're actually going to rehearse next month together for the first time in two years since hmm. right after the first little wave of COVID where we thought it was kind of safe to maybe have a rehearsal. We did a one rehearsal and then everything kind of shut down again. But, um, you know, maybe you do get better at your craft or like me specifically. Maybe I know my limitations, but um, I almost feel like you could put the two records together. But J-Rod is, is funny, too, because back in the old days, I don't know if Jason did records this way, but like the first Hades album. We literally would have five guys sitting in a room. Jimmy, put me louder. The drummer, put me louder. Me and Ed, put me louder. Me and Scott LePage, put me louder. And now J. Rob, when I first met him, he's like, "All right, here's how I mix. I don't allow you in my room while you're mixing." I'm like, "What the hell are you talking about, dude? I'm not gonna be there." And he's like, "No, no." He's like, "I'm gonna send you the mix, and then you tell me what you think." So the first time I work with him, he sent me the mix, and I'm like, "What the hell? Does this guy actually know what a mix should sound like? This is amazing. This is pretty much exactly what I would have done." So. You know, we just left them alone and, you know, very happy with the way both albums came out. But I'm you know, glad that people like you, like Dread the Dawn, Cassius King, even better. Yeah. No, absolutely. Oh, I want to point out, not only is it on Nomad Eel Records, that's the uh, California label, Matt. Sure. So maybe that's why you're pushing that. But in Europe, it's on MDD, MDD. Records. Sure. Mm -hmm. MDD Records in uh, Germany. And they actually have a different bonus track. They have a Judas Priest bonus track where Nomad Eel has the two Kiss cover for the bonus tracks on the CD. Okay, cool. Thanks for clearing that up. Yeah. Oh, um, you're you're yeah. So now, Jason, let's get to you in terms of your vocals. I mean, so your approach now with Cassius King is obviously much different than anything that you've done 
with the bins, at least the bins I know that you've been in, um, you know, over the years, obviously Watchtower, Dangerous Toys and Broken Teeth. And really with Cash is King, you really harken back to that cl those classic metal influences. Obviously, you know, many people are, you know, you know, um, comparing them to, to, you know, Dio style uh, vocals. And I don't know if, if I've ever heard really anyone, you know, come close to really that voice and style and doing it as well as you're doing on these records. It's very impressive. I mean, did you know immediately what you wanted to do vocally upon hearing the music for Cash is King, even going back to Field Trip when you first jumped on board with Dan? And, or did you, have to sort of experiment a little before you knew how you really wanted to approach the vocals with this band. Um, when Dan, thank you for the compliments, by the way. Uh, I, I've always been a Dio fan, uh, you know, from his rainbow days, the, uh, the, the ideas uh, only come from the, the inspiration of, you know, the song or the riff or the vibe of the, you know, the color and the timber of uh, the tracks that I'm sent. And it could be from any project, uh, not just stuff coming from Dan, but 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 any of the, the people that I write with or the one million projects that I'm involved in. Um, <clears throat> the um, So, you know, like Dan, here's a scenario. Dan will send me, uh, you know, two or three new ideas or, and uh, whatever and if they have you know they'll have drums if it if it's only a click i probably won't i'll go does this have drums on it don't send it to me even unless it has drums if it has bass even better because i'm going to get a better idea of where i need to go vocally uh with tone or how how dark the lyric is even you know i feel like supposed to be when i'm sort of telling the story right mm -hmm. um and, and, and that's very, very important. The, the, the idea that people call, you know, well, what kind of band is Cassius King? What, what can I expect? And, oh, if you like stoner rock and doom and, you know, and stuff like that, you're gonna, you're gonna like this. And that's fine. People can try to describe Cassius King all they want. Uh, but ultimately when you think about what, some people don't know that I'm a like an old school thrash metal singer who's singing rock and roll, you know? Mm -hmm. So when you know my history, like Matt, you seem to know my history. Uh, and of course, Dan does the, the idea, you know, if they only know me from dangerous toys or broken teeth is like, well, he's this butt rock guy. What's he doing singing this Dio style, doomy kind of hard rock, you know, dark, 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 you know, toned rock, you know, whatever you, you want to call it. Um, and Dan coming, coming from, uh, uh, you, you know, Hades and, and if they've heard the, the vessel of light and the, even Patriarchs and black, of course, they're going to know that he's leaning heavy on, you know, the, the darker side of, uh, of just bluesy guitar playing. And when you say that you think of, okay, well, man, that, that could be anything that's, that's kiss and acdc bluesy guitar playing you know so with his uh he likes to pull the tuning down a little bit and that's cool uh but what's happening with his bluesy riffs and kind of dirgy tempos and stuff it's making me feel like that's where the vocals kind of need to work as well uh so you know that's kind of i if it sounds you know it usually it's in minor key so that also yeah. kind of shoves me into like an aussie do frame of mind uh and makes me think about you know what what would geezer what would geezer butler write about here you know mm -hmm. uh and because i love geezer's lyrics and um you know try not to talk about war it's hard to not write metal lyrics that don't have to do with war and pain you know so but um you know i found a few topics uh that really worked well uh i like to you know walk around in the you know hang out with the tombstone sing to the tombstones under the full moon is kind of like where these kind of riffs are pointing me uh i know that sounds doom and gloom but you know that's kind of like uh 
happens in heavy metal lyrics anyway. And it's quite romantic, actually. Um, so the, the, you know, where I'm going vocal with my tone and everything is influenced by Dan's guitar. That's, that's probably the shortest answer I can give. Okay. Fantastic. Well, let's, let's get into the first single and video off the record for the track abandoned paradise. Uh, you know, musically it's just, it's got that mid tempo groove with Dan's obviously his signature, you know, doing metal riffs and tone. And, and I saw that, you know, Michael Gilbert also from Flotsam and Jetsam played the lead on that track as well. So I guess, you know, go ahead and talk about, you know, Dan, the band in paradise and how you got Michael on board for this track as well. Um, well, it's funny. So Hades played a show, a couple of shows, Michael says in 1988, uh, Hades opened up for Flotsam and Jetsam. I remember one show, Michael says it was two shows. And then we had no contact until about two years ago. Uh, his publicist was my publicist for the, um, I think it was Thy Serpent Rise, Vessel of Light, Thy Serpent Rise, or Last Ride. And uh, she asked me if I wanted to interview any of her bands. I'm like, no, because I don't get paid to write. I'm not going to interview anybody. Thanks anyway, though. And mm -hmm. she's like, what about uh, any way you could put Michael Gilbert in uh, Outlaw Biker? Because I write for Outlaw Biker. I'm like, you probably named one of the few guys I would actually do an interview with just because he was so nice to us so many years ago. So, and I'm, I'm thinking like, Michael's not going to remember me. It's the year 2021. We haven't spoken since 1988. And he, he remembered everything. It was so like weird talking with him. And he was actually doing vocals. He has a recording studio in his house. And Rob Dukes and I were doing some cover songs together. And we just stayed in touch a little bit. And then um, I texted him. I said, hey, man, would you want to play a solo on the next uh, Cassius Kim album. He's like, I'd love to. I'm in Europe right now. And it's like, his text was like, Jason, if you text Jason, he gets back to you in like one second. And Michael Gilbert was in Europe on tour and he wrote back immediately. Yeah, let's do it. And just because, you know, we, we reunite, reunited uh, for an outlaw biker interview. Um, oh, cool. What a great guy, great guitar player. And, you know, uh, Jason always likes more guitar solos in the music than I do. And we usually use my buddy, Scott LePage, who was on the first Hades album. Mm -hmm. And I just thought, you know, after doing the Patriarchs and Black Album, I played with like 12 different people. And Jimmy Shum was like, no, 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 don't ask anybody outside of the Hades realm. Listen. And I'm like, eh, he's such a nice guy. And, you know, he's a great guitar player. And, you know, we all love the way it turned out. Fantastic. Now, Jason, you know, um, I saw, you know, I saw a breakdown that you did lyrically for the record. And A Band of Paradise really has a, an interesting concept lyrically. Definitely something that a thinking man, I think, would really enjoy. Why don't you talk a little bit about what uh, gave you the idea of lyrical concepts for this track? Well, I think I, I think I came across the title. I can't pinpoint it uh, if it be. I know that there is a book uh, with the same title. I know that there's probably other songs with the same title or something similar. I know it's not a completely original idea. But I love the title very much. Um, I don't feel like it's direct plagiarism, you know, when <laughs> just because it's the same title of a book or a movie or whatever. But mm -hmm. I do know this, that the idea of, uh, of someone working their entire life to create a home for their, themselves and their family and it become their Shangri-La, become their island of of uh you know happiness uh and then you know i i and i also think that it's like lingering like uh lockdown and covid scare kind of okay. kind of this you know place in my head um where you know uh, people are gonna lose their their house people are gonna lose their mm -hmm. you know a rich man can be a poor man overnight you know uh, or it's very apocalyptic on top of that, it's, especially when you say the the words abandoned paradise. It's like man overboard. It's jump ship. It's like, mm -hmm. hey, the house is on fire. Jump out the window. You know, er you're losing everything in a flash. Um, and I thought that the idea uh, was very uh, fearful and um, enlightening at the same time, like you know you don't you don't know it's that it's the instinct that people have the fight or flight kind of thing that comes to mind if like you know but you don't you don't have you can't like hold that in your hand it's it's not a tangible instinct by way of uh 
scenario, boom, your house just blew up and you and the kids mm -hmm. are okay. And you're out in the front yard going, what are we going to do? Mm -hmm. So something similar to that maybe, or just like I said before, uh, you know, very, it's very eighties to think of, but boom, a nuclear bomb. And you had a, a shell, a bomb shelter in the back and you're, you got nothing. You got mm -hmm. nothing or, or like just, um, you know, the old, the old story, like, you know, what if you lose everything by way of nature and, uh, and, uh, starting over is hell. Um, so, mm -hmm. you know, having to leave something that you've worked your whole life for it to be taken away by, uh, because of war or acts of God or whatever, I think this is very scary. And, uh, you know, fear, fear, fear based, uh, scenarios are always good and fun to write lyrics. <laughs>
you know, it's got that obviously the no frills rock and roll approach, but obviously with Cassius King uh, and this record particularly, it's quite the departure from what most knew you for uh, with your vocal approach. And obviously, as you were you know uh, mentioning earlier, I'm sure a lot of it that has to do with the music that's written and what you're feeling. Obviously, you're not going to write about the, the things you write about with Dangerous Toys and Broken Teeth and with this band. No. But for a guy, you know, who's traditionally obviously not known for such really, I guess, introspective lyrics like you're doing in concepts. As an artist, I mean, how important is it for you, if at all, you know, is it to you to be able to, I guess, display to your fans, rock and metal fans in general, that, you know, you, you've got the skills and wherewithal to write about these ideas and concepts outside of what you've done over the years with those other bands. Is that something you really sort of want to also maybe kind of push out there and, and let your, you know, fans know that, you know, you, you can you can write these lyrics too if you wanted to and just if the, the project or the band is, is you know, fits it. Well, if if people and that once again thank you because you're you're making me uh sound like i'm a reader and i'm not uh, <laughs> i don't read uh i i think it's something to do with my brain uh i i tend to read the same uh line over and over and over and i have to start over you know it's, i don't know mm. but i'm working on it um i have a library of books that i plan to read uh when i'm an old man retired now, the idea of, um, once again, I wanted to just throw The Abandoned Paradise, a good way to sort of put it would be like movies and stories like Legend or Omega Man uh, and okay. stuff like that, where the world is over and you're the only sole survivor and it's, you know, you and a pack of dogs and you're having to start all over from scratch. That's kind of a good simpleton way to look at uh, Abandoned Paradise. But if people uh have been the, the ones who've been following me know but there's uh a lot of records i've made that have these darker uh side of lyrics in the in the um in the late 90s uh, i i had a band uh and we've recently started it back up called godzilla motor company and these lyrics uh with godzilla motor company are very similar to like what's happening here in uh, cassius king kind of uh darker themes uh, self uh self reflection a little bit uh dealing with some fantasy and in involved uh, ma mainly uh you know uh other worlds thinking about uh existence in other worlds uh whether they be humans aliens humanoids robots you know nothing is off the table mm -hmm. um so godzilla motor company did did a lot of stuff like that uh but very similar to cassius king lyrics uh, uh that godzilla motor company record it's self-titled it's available everywhere and then the uh i made two records this is all beef pre obviously pre cassius king mm -hmm. i made two records with an italian guitar player by the name of david tiso who is like a, a I don't want to say black metal or death metal, but it was that's just pretty close, but very progressive. Okay. Uh, called Ifal Duath. I think I'm saying that right. E P H A L D U A T H. Ifal Duath, something like that. Uh, anyway, um, Howling Sycamore is the name of that project we made two records this was pre-pandemic it was like 2016 or 17 that he contacted me and we made we followed through with two records much like cassius king and he wrote all of the lyrics for that it was very inspiring david did uh it was very inspirational uh his wife karen crisis oh, who okay. some people might know that name sure. see you're you're mm -hmm. reacting uh, she actually wrote a few. So, so you know, Karen Crisis, her husband is David Tiso. Oh, okay. Didn't know that. So, okay. there's a connection there. And you know, probably what David's into if you know what Karen is into. Sure. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Uh, so, the lyrics were incredibly uh, influential to me. And, uh, you know, I, I got to tell Karen that a couple of times. And, and so, uh, that kind of inspired me a little bit to try to teach myself how to write like that a little, a little more. Okay. And then I'm in power metal bands. Uh, uh, one band is called Igniter and I've done about seven records with Igniter and they're all, 
gloom and doom and this kind mm. of that's power metal you of sure. course it's going to be you know mm -hmm. uh cloaked swordsmen riding black horses that breathe fire you know whatever mm -hmm. yeah uh mm -hmm. and then um uh evil evil united is another band that i made three records with uh since around the same time 2014 maybe pre howling sycamore pre no it's, yeah after godzilla motor company but yeah and those are like thrash classic metal thrash they lean into power metal but that's just a token name mm -hmm. uh and those those records are fucking heavy as shit and uh the the some of the lyrics are brutal about brutal things uh and uh so yeah i mean i've i've been writing heavy metal lyrics long enough to uh to probably put out a lyric book uh which i've actually thought of and all the cassius king lyrics would definitely be in there because i'm super proud of them yeah, no, fantastic. Yeah, they're they're like I said, the concepts are very. I, I guess I love just to me personally. I like getting lyrics that you know make you think, and that yeah. they're not just straight in your face. And you know, they're they're you know obviously just obvious with, with their words. So, uh, yeah, kudos to you with the with the lyrics on this. Absolutely on this record. Thank you. Um, and you know, I was um, as I was talking about earlier about the, really the the sound and the style of the band. You know, Dan musically. Cassius King really reminds me a lot of, of nonfiction stuff because it's really got that 90s sort of mid-tempo groove to a lot of the songs. And the riffs are very bluesy, like on Doomsday, you know, Hand. Um, and you had similar stuff, you know, a, a similar style to me. I think, you know, Cassius King is as close to the nonfiction stuff as anything that you've you've done, meaning compared to Vessel Light, which I think is just a little bit more of your your, you know, you know, classic downtrodden slow tempo dune metal uh, stuff. But what I think Cassius King has that nonfiction didn't, obviously, are those 80s elements to it. It really has such a unique and refreshing, I think, take on your typical modern-day stoner and doom sound that a lot of the bands really don't have. Most of the, to me, at least, most of the modern-day doom and stoner bands have just, it's very obviously, you know, uh, Sabbath-influenced, um, and it really has, you know, a lot of them are, are starting to, use analog and try to get that, you know, that, that old school sound and style. But with those eighties elements that you guys have with Cassius King on top of obviously Jason's vocals, I think you guys definitely have your own unique take on this kind of music, which, you know, like I said, it's not really, it's not that easy to do. I know you've told me before that you simply just write riffs and that there's no really plan or thought process that goes into it in terms of what you're trying to extract specifically in terms of the style. So I guess my question is then, and as you mentioned before, in terms of the writing process, how you come up with the riffs and kind of ship it off to, to Jimmy and, and Ron. I mean, with those now, I mean, how vital, I would I should say, is, I guess, then the rhythm section with Jimmy and Ron in terms of what songs you use and perform for each project you have. I mean, does what they do with your riffs in terms of the tempo specifically, in the end, does that determine which songs will be on Cassius King and which ones will go on Vest of a Light? I mean, how do you yeah. delineate the tracks to the bands? Yeah, you know, I, I feel like all of my music has been one way since 1990, like since nonfiction. And I was really trying to get Hades to tune down back in the mid 80s, but the other guitar players and Jimmy didn't feel comfortable with tuning down their, their uh, strings. They thought the, uh, the intonation would go off. But um, I do want to point out that Jimmy. Actually, you mentioned the song Doomsday. Jimmy Shulman wrote all that music. Mm -hmm. um, I think I wrote one little tiny part, my favorite part that Jason sings, my favorite melody line under the low Doomsday's hand part. Um, yeah, that's so, a great part. Mm -hmm. Yeah, it's, that's my favorite vocal line. It's so, so awesome. And it has to be in Jimmy's song. You know, what are you, what are you doing, Jason? <laughs> but uh, no, seriously, though, like, I, I never feel like that big of a difference between, like, whether it's Patriarchs in Black, Cassius King, vessel of light because i write all those songs over the same course of a winter we'll say and i'll write 20 songs and i'm sen sending 10 to johnny kelly 10 to ron lip nicky you know okay. uh, jason gets so to me they could all be interchanged but it's funny that once the vocalist starts singing i don't know how this is possible but it gives the whole feel even be when you listen to the song the next time as soon as the song starts, I'm like, that's that's a Cassius King song, and it could only be a Cassius King song, um, mm. which is so weird because 
obviously the vocals don't even start in say till 30 seconds in but to me it just has such a at least a slightly different vibe that each project is a little bit different but it's all coming from you know me writing songs mostly right up here um i did write a song uh driving home from basketball jason 13 months ago 14 months ago october because i called the song october i was driving home in my car and i heard a riff and that's the song that became pariah to messiah and i think that was right after i started uh talking with johnny kelly about doing a patriarchs in black album i'm like i said maybe that song should be a patriarchs in black song but you know it the singer just means so much to the song as to how the end result is going to be ron mm -hmm. likes playing a little more up tempo we're a vessel of light we want to be really doomy so ron likes cassius king a lot more i think than he likes vessel of light but um it, it's funny how even if i could write 20 songs once you add the different singers to it it becomes i think its own entity but i loved nonfiction at the time it was like to me it was like hades was here and then when i did nonfiction, nonfiction was here i was just in love with nonfiction. i was it was exactly what i wanted after hades like just to simplify the songs accentuate my riffs don't have the crazy rhythm section distracting from my riffs and i feel like you know cassius king is similar to that i i like i said since 1990 i feel like my guitar playing is i found myself in 1990 and it's still how i'm playing in the year uh, 2022 i want to i wanted to add and and doing press over the past few days it's kind of like something that i realized uh verbally by just kind of you know blabbing myself uh here listening to my own voice kind of describe it a little bit dan's dan's uh riffs are just dan's riffs like i feel like the 20 songs that he's writing over over the winter it he could send random 10 songs to me and random 10 songs to somebody else and it wouldn't matter like like let's say i'm dan and i'm gonna go okay well these 10 are definitely patriarchs and black songs and these 10 are definitely cassius king and then i was i was joking yesterday in in an interview i said what if he accidentally sent me sent me the the patriarchs and black songs <laughs> and sent the you know the patriarchs you know the cassius king stuff to you know to the other guys and it's mm -hmm. like it wouldn't matter to me. I wouldn't know any difference. And I, I feel like that's a good thing. Oh, shit, I sent you the wrong songs. No, you didn't. Let me have these. It's, it's, mm. it sounds like Cassius King to me uh, because it's Dan Lorenzo. So I, I think that it's a it's sort of this sort of like upside down comp compliment to Dan that ju just just be you. Just be you all the time. Don't change anything keep listening to Aerosmith and Cheap Trick and Kiss and ACDC and tuning your guitar down and just keep doing what you're doing because it's working and people dig the songs that, you know, obviously you've, you've, you know, I, I as long as you want me to keep singing on your songs, I will, Dan. So mm -hmm. it should be that way with the other singers too, especially if it's, uh, uh, giving your song some kind of identity under this umbrella or that umbrella kind of a thing it's separating your songs i'm agreeing with dan that you know when i sing on it it's going to be a cassius king thing mm -hmm. so if it's sure. me and dan it's going to be a cassius king thing
Well, and what's interesting too, Dan, is you know, like you said, you're not you're you're not really coming from a Black Sabbath uh, you know, spot. I mean, like like Jason was saying, he just laid out really the bands that you always talk about that really yep. influenced you, um, which is interesting because most you know, in in this sort of sound, that's what what emanates it emanates a lot of from the Sabbath. But as what's I think unique too about your style is that it's not coming from that pure 70s Sabbath. It's got the Aerosmith and the Kiss and all the other. Uh, yeah. Which is, I know probably weird to some people. If I, if, the, if we only, if I only talked about the bands that I was influenced by, you would have a totally different idea of how my music would sound if you never heard of me. But uh, Thursday night, my wife and I were watching Showtime and we saw the Dio special mm -hmm. and my wife, when uh, heaven and hell came on the screen, my wife's like, oh, I remember thinking that's not black Sabbath. And I remember, I remember thinking, I like Black Sabbath more than I ever did when Dio came on and they did Heaven and Hell. I was just like, that's the record I want to listen to. Like, mm -hmm. I have such a short attention span that I know Black Sabbath is an important heavy metal band, but when they start to meander and like, I was listening to the radio the just half an hour before this, some DJ was playing some of our songs and he's playing some other bands and they did that typical thing where the song ends and everybody's like, yeah, that, 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 and it was going on for a minute. I'm like, I can't do this. I can't. You know, I have a really short attention span. So if you're going to write, um, and then I, I'm saying that, but we have two eight-minute songs on this album, which I love. <laughs> For the most part, I prefer, like I told um, the bass player from The Cursed, who was a radio guy for Atlantic Records in 2007, I said, my mind goes like this. It goes like Black Sabbath riffs with Ramones length style songs. Three mm. and a half minutes out. Mm. You know, yeah. doesn't need a guitar solo necessarily. You know, But, you know, it's great. Like Jason... You know, we'll say he pushes me to do some guitar solos in the song Bad Man Down. And then I listen. And Jimmy says to me for the third time today, who's playing those leads on Bad Man Down? Is that LePage? I'm like, no, that's me, dude. He's like, they're pretty good. He's like, they're not bad, man. I'm like, yeah, I know, you know. But um, and then like we I talked about this the other day. Jason said to me, uh, hey man, what do you think if we put a flute at the beginning of Genesis? And I'm like, of course. And and Jimmy Showman, I use him as my second confidant. My wife is my first confidant. She sits downstairs and I'll I'll be playing a riff. I'll look to see if she's like, you know, doing like this. Mm -hmm. I bring it to Jimmy Shulman. And Jimmy Shulman, I love him, but sometimes he'll tell me no. And I'm like, you know, Jason said flute on Genesis. And Jimmy said no. I said, no, I think I want a flute on Genesis. You know, so I'll, I'll mm -hmm. override his opinion. I care very much what his opinion is because he gives it to me straight. But uh, sometimes I do override him. So a guy like Jason, you know, he, he knew the flautist as you described him, right? Mm -hmm. the old watchtower manager and i love it at the beginning of genesis and just it's just a lip makes the record a little bit different sure. makes the ears a little bit like fresh for the you know the, what's to follow i feel like uh this this sounds opinionated and that's that's fine because we're talking about you know J jimmy has has a say of course it can be overridden and yeah. that's that's kind of like the democracy here if we are making a record or just Dan is making a record. See, so um, I feel like uh, when I heard that intro and I can't even remember if I had the yeah, lyrics just... yet or, or if I've even, I'd even cut the vocal for that song yet or if it even had a title yet, I don't recall, but it doesn't matter. So. When I yeah, hear yeah. the, I don't think so either. Uh, that's why I'm doubting myself. When I hear the acoustic intro there's no there's no clock there's no click track there's no clock it just sounds thrown in there and it sounds like i'm dissing the idea and i'm totally not i'm all about you know let's go let's do something crazy for this so we can vibe vibe the listener out before this song kicks in and crosses your head right so i i feel like i knew what he what he was you know doing by shoving this acoustic just this big sort of meandering acoustic chord and it's loud you know j-rod was not afraid to turn that guitar up it's loud you know so you got this just acoustic like blah and that that's all it was it did it like three or four times and i'm like okay and then the song kicks in i'm like okay i want to sing over this or this this is a donut without sprinkles. I, this, I've got to put some sprinkles on this fucking donut. You know, this <laughs> there's no icing on this cake. This cake tastes good, but aesthetically, it sounds like it's thrown in there. Let's try to get something to sort of have it melt its way a little bit easier into the the big 
climax when the song kicks in. I, I, this is when the discussion started with, uh, with Dan and simultaneously with Fred, uh, my, my old time buddy who managed Watchtower in the eighties. And he's a master musician. He sings, he plays guitar, he plays keys, he plays keyboards, he plays flute. He, he, he plugs this, he's got a, a pickup on his flute and he plugs it into his guitar pedal board. And his pedal board is like a fucking spaceship. So I can just see him cutting those, those flute parts, uh, you know, in his studio, just playing a flute through this, all this echo and weird, you know, phaser and stuff. Um, so I knew that it was going to work for the, the vibe of what Cassius King has going. Uh, you know, the, the trippy Zeppelin Sabbath vibe that sometimes our tunes have, I knew that that was going to work. And I, I just wanted to kind of warn the rest of the guys might be some fluid on this. <laughs> I'm glad Dan liked it. Love it. <laughs> yeah, no, it does. I think it sounds great. Too. I think it's perfect. And, you know, I just want to, you know, ask you guys something too here. Now, now no matter, I think, what you have both done over the years, obviously you both known, you know, in metal circles for what you've really done, you know, with your bands in the eighties, you know, people hear your names. Um, Dan, obviously with Hades and Jason, obviously with Watchtower and Dangerous Toys, Cassius King is obviously, you know, obviously a, a major departure for many of those bands. It's a departure, but we live now in a, in a day and age in hard rock and metal and really just music in general, where it's all about nostalgia, you know. So even though bands like Broken Teeth and Vessel of Light have been making, you know, noise for years, most older rock metal fans tend to kind of immediately associate you guys with, with those bands. And these are obviously the fans that you obviously are, you know, targeting since they're familiar with yourselves and what you've done musically in the past. So, I mean, for you guys, how challenging has it been, if at all, you know, to get really those fans to embrace you being part of something that they don't traditionally know you for? And then, you know, to get them away from simply just wanting to hear Dan from Hades and Jason from Watchtower and Dangerous Toys, especially, like I said, in the modern day of music nostalgia, where not a lot of people are really chomping at the bit to hear a new band or project or, or you know, and simply just want you to go back to what they initially know you for musically from your, you know, your stuff in the 80s. Do you guys, has that been a challenge? You know, even though you guys have been doing other stuff for the last 30 years, do you see that as being a challenge, you know, especially in today's day of music yeah, nostalgia it's a great point matt and I, I it is a challenge to get everybody to listen to it but so um you know if i get an email from somebody or on instagram or whatever um i'll be hey man how do you discover us oh i've been a big fan of yours since hades first album or i've been a big fan of jason's his whole career and it, it's really a cool thing because even though the pool is getting smaller the amount of people willing to listen to a brand new hard rock heavy metal doom band in 2022 there are people out there who actually discover us who didn't know anything about us. Mm. And now possibly you're interested in buying the, you know, if not the whole back catalog, a bunch of the stuff. I mean, I've, I've been like shocked and surprised. It's not like thousands of them, but there's definitely people who never heard anything that I've done previously, but bought field trip or Patriarchs in black or Cassius King dread the dawn. And it's like, I, I wasn't aware of you. And now I'm mm. listening to your back catalog. I mean, it happens on a pretty regular basis, not thousands of people, but there are people out there who are just discovering us. But yeah, obviously we're trying to read some of the old Hades and Watchtower and Dangerous Toys and, and nonfiction. I got a couple of buddies at Sirius XM who've been really cool about whenever they play a Dangerous Toys song, no one every time, but often enough, they'll mention Cassius King. So mm. it's a combination of both. Mm. Yeah. I think that uh, it's a great question, Matt. The, um, I'm you described me to a T. I have a hard time hearing anything new by Iron Maiden, just to okay. pick a band mm -hmm. that's probably not random. Uh, as soon as they stopped writing about the devil and whores, I got bored. <laughs> so, um, that's I, it meant to be funny, but uh, I, I have no doubt that I if I if I had the the last you know five or 10 Iron Maiden records, I'd probably want to listen to them. And I'm sure I would school myself and probably regret, you know, I should have, I should have gave this a chance a decade ago or it the same. Now, uh, just to kind of piggyback Dan is all, um, there's, there's people that 
you know, had probably written off, you know, they, they weren't, they weren't a dangerous toys fan. They don't like the tone of my voice on those old records, especially watchtower. It's like, Hey, I love the music, but I can't stand that singer. It's like, it's kind of like, um, and I don't mean to be picking on the singer. I'm just saying, yeah. right. Uh, mm -hmm. there's some people that don't like rush and I, and I get in their face and I, and not, you know, uh, carefully. Right. Mm -hmm. And I say, uh, it's the vocals, isn't it? You know, I call, I'm calm with them. It's the vocals. Mm -hmm. Yeah. How do you, how'd you know? Well, it's always the vocals. You know, I love Rush. Their music is great. As soon as that guy starts singing, it's like, I'm, I'm out. Can't handle it. And I said, okay, well, let's play a game. So pick, you know, your favorite singers who you like the best. And let's let's erase all of Getty Lee's vocals and you can put whatever singer you want on Rush tunes. Do you like Rush now? And they can't even imagine, just like none of us can imagine Rush without Getty Lee singing. I cannot. Mm -hmm. um, I'm sure it would be great. I mean, what are you going to put Sammy Hagar and Rush? You're going to put, uh, you know, Robert Plant would probably be able to sing Rush and it would be cool because that's what Getty originally, I mean, their first few records, they were trying to be like a Led Zeppelin. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. And um, so anyway, I feel like uh, if people, you know, like what Dan is doing, uh, let's say Ves with Vessel of Light and then they hear Cassius King, I don't see why they wouldn't at least go, wow, this is pretty good. At least, you know, give it some, some, some fair, you know, mm -hmm. uh, and then go, wow, who's this singer? And the, and then you tell them, well, it's the guy from dangerous toys is like, ah, dangerous toy. Really? It's the same guy. And they're sh fucking shocked. Yeah. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Because they don't know that I can sing with tone. You know, mm -hmm. they just think I'm going, you know, screechy, you know, mongoose voice, you know, mm -hmm. angry badger, you know, Mm -hmm. uh, all the time and uh so that's if people are willing to and the same with uh, you know some of my people who follow me don't don't know dan and i go remember that band hades that's him that's mm -hmm. him he's got this whole slew of material and so i think that it's been working both ways that that you described um or questioned and uh, I think that that's great. I think that it's, uh, but it's, they're not, you know, it's not a herd of people. It's mm -hmm. not like a mass uh, exodus of people running towards us. Uh, mm -hmm. You know, it, it's very, it's, it's been slow to answer the question. It's been, it's been slow, but that's okay. You win your fans one at a time. Sure. Now, are you noticing? Is it more of your the the you know the, the middle fans from from your guys' generation that embraces embracing Cassius King, or is it really the younger stoner and doom metal fans who this music's more resonating with? Considering because there's been really a, you know a really solid burgeoning stoner and doom scene uh, really on a global scale over the last ten plus years. So do you know is it more the younger fans that are kind of you know coming more towards Cassius King, or is it your your fans from your previous bands that are really embracing it? Honestly, I. I <clears throat> I'm sorry. Yeah, no, it's. I was just going to say, I can't really tell. So, okay. Man, what do you think? Yeah, I've, I've never asked for birth certificates or address <laughs> for people who send me emails and stuff, but I have a feeling it's it's nobody under 30. I can tell that much, I, I assume. Okay. Mm -hmm. Okay. Yeah, just curious because it's just, yeah. um, like I said, it's it's just an interesting time with, with music and, you know, putting out new music. So it's just something I'm always kind of trying to figure out myself yeah. and what the, the tastes are and what are people's, you know, music preferences are so i mean now just uh you guys now both obviously have been very busy in 2022 and while i have you here jason i mean obviously you've been the the ultimate bullpen guy for some all-time great classic metal bands this year especially over the last pretty much a month or two um you recently obviously filled in on vocal duties for both mark tonio and accept and the great john bush and armored saint and the craziest thing is just really how close both of those you know were to each other back just almost back to back so I guess my question is, you know, first of all, I mean, I mean, I, I would have to, you know, I mean, you're a real laid back guy, but was it pretty, you know, was there a lot of pressure on you to perform both of those gigs in such a short matter of time, one after the other? Or was it, you know, maybe a bit easier, or I should say less pressure doing maybe the Armored Saint film because you already had now done accept and kind of got your feet wet with that? Because, uh, and obviously there's been nothing but, you know, um, great response to what you uh, were able to bring to both of those uh, situations. Um, I, 
it's it's one long like oh shit <laughs> like the whole the whole time was just mm -hmm. oh shit uh i can almost remember <clears throat> it's like the reaction the the sort of like teetering to decide to say yes kind mm -hmm. of a moment uh you know i'm on the phone with with the middleman i'll say because a friend of mine texts me and he goes call this guy and so i call this guy and before this is before i'm on the phone with the wolf hoffman from accept mm -hmm. this would have been in october uh he, you know and i'm going i'm in my i'm like ha there's a war inside my head you know i'm mm -hmm. i'm I'm just getting over an upper respiratory infection myself. So I'm not even hundred percent. And I'm telling everyone who will listen to me, who I'm on the phone with before I actually pack my bags. Well, I'm not hundred percent. I'm just warning you, you know, I mean, I can sing, I have energy, I'm not dead, you know, but there's some, there's some goblins living in here, you know, mm -hmm. and <clears throat> I can almost cut it like a knife. That decision where I'm like, I, damn it i need to do this you know and that was with a little help of uh of from my wife and my bosses as well it's like i'm talking to anyone who'll go yeah you kind of need to do this uh uh it was a very within like five minutes you know and so and then i'm on the phone with wolf and then you know logistics and uh, uh, you know i get a text from wolf an hour later pack your bags you know what I mean? And then plane mm -hmm. tickets start showing up in my email and it was just one long, Oh shit. Oh shit. Oh shit. Oh shit. Mm -hmm. And it was not really any different. It was just such a surprise when I'm, you know, two or three weeks later after I'd gotten home from the accept run that my phone's ringing and I'm going, and I'm on the phone with Joey Vera from Marmot Saint. And I'm, and I'm going, he's like, dude. And I'm like, dude. And he's like, dude <laughs> dude i had just seen them you know a week earlier in san antonio mm -hmm. uh armored saint wasp and it was amazing and john sounded amazing and um the differences here matt are um uh, i'm obviously a huge fan of except and armored saint uh, that's like my high school soundtrack, throwing some merciful fate and some venom. And of course, all of the others you can just stack mm -hmm. on top. And that's my, you know, that's my boom box, you know? Mm -hmm. Um, and then covering, covering except watchtower covered like eight except songs, you know, back in the day. So, uh, I had sent uh the middleman his name's ed aborn is a, a friend of wolves and um uh, i'd sent him a couple of links of me covering except songs i sent them fast as a shark which is igniter has covered fast as a shark and that's just on the on youtube mm -hmm. and then watchtower covering run if you can from the breaker album and that's from like 1999 or something and uh and wolf got a hold of them and that's kind of how it all just kind of blossomed into that but but i gotta say that happening twice that's lightning striking twice yeah, right. in the mm -hmm. same place and they say that never happens so it's kind of a, a just a completely bizarre chain of events i feel like and then a friend of mine my co-host on my my podcast says uh you know what's up with uh these guys getting up you know they get past Tennessee and the Carolinas and they come down with this infection. Mm -hmm. And it's like, man, I don't want anybody to get sick, but something's going on right there. It's like lead singer Bermuda triangle or something. <laughs> so, um, I don't know, but I will, I will throw this in there. I basically twice in a matter of like a month, I got to eat breakfast with Dan Lorenzo get a ride to the newark airport <laughs> dan lorenzo in one day i got to oh and he picked me up from the hotel that i know that was backwards but and then a few weeks later i got to have a sit down with not only dan lorenzo from cassius king and i got to meet ron lipnicki for the very first time this was mm -hmm. would have been on the armored saint run there at the wellmont and uh uh, montclair. montclair new jersey 
Very so cool. yeah, it's been it's been crazy, uh, crazy time. Uh, I've known the Armored Saint guys since uh, like 1985. So uh, very friendly, and me and Bush were pen pals, and you know, call each other once in a while. And and uh, the guys in Armored Saint have been like step brothers, you know, that you see once a year at Thanksgiving or something for a long time. So that was different. To compare, a mm. uh, li little bit di of difference there by uh, uh, the accept guys treated me like I was, you know, the new little brother kind of thing. And I was, you know, whatever I needed, the crew and the, the tour manager, every, I was just, it was great. I was treated very, very well. And uh, same with Armored Saint, of course. So sure. it's, what a trip. But the preparations, because there was no rehearsal. It was mm -hmm. get the call next day. I'm on a plane. I've got a notebook. Uh, the notebook goes on stage with me uh, verbatim. Both both of those runs with both bands. So it was somebody described it uh, as uh, you have balls of steel to even attempt to try mm -hmm. to fill the shoes of both of those guys twice in a month. And what you don't. How did you learn the song so fast? You know, it's like, well, it's, I'm a singer. I love music. If I'm going to sing something, I'm going to listen to it until I walk onto the stage. Mm -hmm. So it was a lot of cramming, studying, uh, and a little, a little bit uh, of a test. Uh, but that it's the funnest. I can't, I can't wait to go take this test. You know, mm -hmm. it was one of those. Mm -hmm. um, but I love both singers, and they're both legends. Mark and yeah. John are fucking living legends in my book. So, mm -hmm. yeah, absolutely, no, great. Now, Dan, you know, you've put out now what five records in four plus years? Uh, the Cassius King records, like I said, Vessel Light and Patriots in Black. I believe you have another one. I think in the vault, if I remember correctly, for Patriots in Black. Was it that you well, said you had? Are you I working on seven albums out in five years? And I finished writing Jeez. the. Um, the next Patriarchs in Black album. And I still have, there's this little Zoom unit on here that I have hundreds of riff ideas that I either have used, maybe say out of, out of 265 pieces of music, there's probably about a 150 things I haven't used. I got, now that it's winter time and I really stopped playing basketball, I got to spend some time listening to this and find some riffs that I, you know, need to develop further with the secondary riff. But yeah, I mean, it's been fun. I've always writing and uh, it, it's just been, I've never had a streak like this, though. I was going to say, I mean, you just eat, sleep, shit, and write riffs all day, man. I mean, because yeah. it's just, I mean, <laughs> the pace you're on is just it's unbelievable. It's so man. weird. It really it's, is. it's so weird. And it's like, I don't even play guitar more than an hour a week, probably. But when I do, it's usually writing. And then I'll go record. But, um, yeah, you know, I don't want to start spending a little more time playing guitar because it's been so fun. But uh, I still have a pretty active life. I work for a supply company, a tattoo supply company called Painful Pleasures. And in the warm months, I play basketball. I like to travel. Shulman and I, Jimmy Shulman and I are flying to South Beach Tuesday, kind of like his 60th birthday present. Mm -hmm. And uh, I, yeah, I plan on doing more. I'm sure Jason and I will have a third record out if he wants, you know, whether it be one year, two years, or three years from now. I mean, maybe we're going, moving a little too quickly for the amount of fans we have, but I certainly envision doing it again sometime, you know, down the road. Yeah, well, well, you've got two thirds of your of your projects and your bands there too. Are, are two of your two of your big partners there are, are located yeah. down in Texas? There, I mean, so when when are you going to trade in your your New Jersey Yankee card there and head down to the Lone Star State? You know, I think if I move anywhere <laughs> other than Key West, Florida, my wife would have my neck. But um, okay, <laughs> yeah, and, and plus, you know, it hasn't really be, been a problem. Like Jason said, he there's bands. He he never met our bass player Jimmy Shulman. You know, we've done two records together and a bunch of cover songs. They actually. Uh, the German label actually is talking now. They want us to release a cover CD. Oh, wow. and we already have a bunch of covers that we've done together. We might we'll probably would have to do a few more. But it, it just gets easier because of the way the world is nowadays. I mean, for all the negativity and all the, the downside of the way the world is, it is kind of getting easier to do projects with people in other states. Yeah. I think that it's uh, – I want to mention this, you know, uh, Dan is a great rainmaker. He he's he's much like me by way of he gathers no moss, but there is a uh, there is something about Dan that I wanted to bring up. That's that's not trying to embarrass him or anything. It's more that 
he uh, has found uh, some people who really care about uh, the music that he writes. And that is um, uh, Damon at, at Nomad Eel Records and, and these guys at MDD. I think that, Dan, that you've, that you've fallen into a couple of sort of, I don't want to say record deals, but you've, you've, you have a knack for, uh, you know, uh, involved, getting involved with, with people who seem to really care about the product and, and, uh, are excited when you have something new to put out. And, and, uh, that's kind of rare because, yeah. um, mm -hmm. it, yeah, you know what yeah. I mean? It's like Joe yeah. Blow can't write some songs and go, Oh, these guys put out everybody's shit. I'll just send it to them. They'll put it out. No, it's not necessarily like that. They, you know, they're going to spend money they had to make to put this out. If they have to believe in the material. So the fact that Dan has been able to uh, become friendly with these, these people who, and it's all just, you know, I'm sure it's Dan's charming personality that has some percentage there uh, by holding weight there. But obviously they have to like his music. What if his riffs mm -hmm. were terrible? They yeah. can still be his friend, but you know, <laughs> There's not really a working relationship going, oh, it's Dan again. He's such a nice guy, but God, his riffs are terrible. You know, that, <laughs> that's not happening. It's the other, yeah. other way around. It's like, Dan, cool. What? You have a whole, a third, a fourth, a fifth Cassius King record, you know? <laughs> yeah. So that's, I think that, uh, the, the like-mindedness is, is crossing over in, in the best way. And, uh, you know, Dan doesn't, I don't know when Dan sleep. He gets up at the crack of dawn every day too. So, <laughs> yeah, no, it is. You're right. It's a good point, Jason. I mean, it is impressive this day and age, especially. You know, I mean, it's hard to get, you know, uh, deals, labels, and so forth. I didn't want to really sink any money into music anymore. And you've got, you know, go for it. You, got I, you guys, don't, I don't know if Matt knows this. You might not be aware of this, and I wasn't aware of it until about three years ago when Vessel of Light was playing a show in Brooklyn. And I was really upset because the label we got wanted to delay our album a couple months. So I'm like, what is, why would you delay it? He's like, oh, I have to put these bands. I'm like, forget it. I'm off this label. And the guy told me like, yeah, but don't you know why? I'm like, what are you talking about? He's like, because your label, all the bands pay him to put out records. I'm like, what? He's like, yeah, the, all these bands, like they offered us the same deal. Give us $2,500 and we'll form a partnership and we'll release your CD. And I'm like, what are you talking about? The, he's like, the bands are paying these labels. And wow. I didn't even know that. There's a yeah. bunch of uh, labels out nowadays where it's like, look, we're in this together. We, we love your music. Give us $2,500 and we're going to... Jason, were you aware of this? I only found this out like three years ago. No, that's a that's a pay to play. Yeah. That's, yeah. A, nor, that's a regular... I'm like, that's a I regular. was in shock. And the guy said to me, yeah. he's like, Dan, he's like, this is the way it is nowadays. Like, you, they probably respect you too much to throw you a thousand they'll give you a thousand dollars but it's not like that for the rest of us and i was in shock that you know yeah. people giving money to a record i thought this was a real label well, they you know i couldn't well it's it. it's no you know i mean i've i've had the biggest record deal you can get and i've had no record deal at all yeah. uh, mm -hmm. the difference now is is it's it's back to diy so yeah. diy to me means okay well we're going to write the songs and we're going to pay for the recording of the record. We're going to deliver the record. Now, if a label has no intention on giving the band anything uh, or it, you're just going to deliver the record, it's, it's recorded, it's mixed. We're giving you all of the artwork. We're paying for the artwork. Everything is done. It's ready to go. And they're not going to spend any money on promotion or ads or, or, promoting any any of the the materials that you have provided to them then they're not doing anything other than delivering it to the pressing plan and paying for the pressing of, of cd of 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 the, the actual product and something like that usually is is they won't even do any of that unless they they get all of the, your digital rights Mm -hmm. and that's not happening at all it's as a matter of fact it's the opposite okay we're going to give you everything that you need to put out a record but it's our we're going to get the digital rights and you're basically going to press and promote this record 
and that's how they get their that's how they get their machine rolling and the labels that are doing that bless their hearts because the more they put into it the more they're going to get out of it in in mechanical royalty in sales in pushing that record um but all of this, the, the the publishing and the and the rights to the songs and the digital rights, if you're if you're giving all of that away, you're not really helping yeah, you're yourself a whole lot. Yeah, especially if they they don't have any kind of campaign. Um, yeah, we've and been I, really lucky where we got to keep all that, and you know the label yeah. puts out the CD and the vinyl. Nomad Eel has some uh, seven inch singles of Cassius King mm-hmm. and. Uh, um, I think Field Trip's finally going to come out on vinyl in a month or so on mm-hmm. Nomad. Yeah, good. and uh, Dread the Dawn is is right after it. It's yeah. stuff's been delivered to the pressing plants, and uh, I'm I'm in the band, and I'm excited about that. I want to listen to that shit on vinyl. Yeah, yeah. Well, I mean, and the vi- I mean, is, I know there was obviously that huge backlog last year. Has the, is that eased up at all, or is that still? Yeah, I I'm hearing year? that 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 okay. caught that has caught up and okay um there was uh i have a, a reissue of a broken teeth record that came out in like 2004 originally and uh and it's 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 coming out on a limited vinyl and and it's just what i have to gauge uh you know the plants the pressing plants and where they are now it's They're like, about nine months behind in America still, and about right and right now months. they are nine months behind. Five and a half okay. to six months in in Europe. Wow! Uh, the, the Patriarchs in Black album is just coming out next week. After you know, it was only took them four months to release it, so that's pretty good actually. Right. Um, this, so this uh, this uh, Broken Teeth record, Guilty Pleasure. I think that the label turned it into the press the the materials to the pressing plants like six months ago. And a few days ago, the boxes shipped and landed on the guys, you know, in the guy's warehouse. So that's that's a six month. But I, I, I think that I didn't know that it was nine, but between so. six and between six and nine sounds about right. But as far as like we're a year away from, you know, being able to fulfill your order, I think that's over. OK, okay. nine months is might as well be a fucking year it's a year it's pretty much the same thing (laughs) exactly yeah Yeah. so yeah totally well one uh jason one last thing for you before we uh wrap this up um you know for those out there that don't know and you you kind of mentioned this before you've got a great podcast video cast yourself called talk louder um you guys did an episode last year which was phenomenal the legs diamond episode oh cool um because that was just that was one of those bands that i always just got got overlooked and fell through the cracks in in the late 70s there and what was great i mean you guys just asked pretty much i that was a band i was always looking to possibly interview because i had so much i wanted to ask you guys asked absolutely everything that i wanted to know where it's like well there's no need to for me to uh to even pursue that anymore but why don't you go ahead and let our listeners and viewers you know let them know a little bit about talk louder and where they could uh check that out it's it's on uh, any anywhere you find podcasts it's it's available it's it's apple it's uh, we film it so it's on youtube uh it's not live it's uh it's we we record them and we edit in post-production uh, it started out uh, during the lockdown. Uh, my producer is Jared Tooten, who plays guitar in Broken Teeth. Me and him are the main songwriters in Broken Teeth. And uh, he gets uh, he gets with me and my buddy Metal Dave and one day uh, in that early lockdown stages. And he's like, uh, what about you guys, you two guys getting the podcast? And the way he described it was like when me and Metal Dave are, say, in a room and there's a bunch of people and we start, you know, we're in the corner talking about heavy metal and punk rock and, you know, Kiss or Riot or whatever. And th- next thing you know, all the nerds were just nerd magnets. All the rock nerds end up going over there. Yeah, man, that's my favorite record. And blah, 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 blah. What about that happening in a podcast? Because I don't listen to podcasts, but I'm a metal nerd. Mm-hmm. But I don't really listen. I mean, that's like paint watching paint dry. Uh, unless it's someone I'm totally freaking out on and I love, you know, mm-hmm. uh, what they're interviewing Gene Simmons. I want to hear that. You know, that's that's somebody that I would probably want to hear. Uh, but I still don't I don't I'm not active uh, in the podcast world other than I just happen to have one. 
uh so that sounded cool and it was kind of a funny uh little thing that you know what jared didn't say is you know it's like uh, you know after we made a couple of them because we didn't we have guests now all the time in the first like 15 or 20 episodes we didn't have any guests it was we picked a topic and it was just wayne's world beavis and butthead and that metal show all rolled into one and three hours later we're talking about this one topic and, and our podcasts were like long and the attention span is crappy but sure. how i think about that is you can pause it and go in get your groceries and come back in the car and turn mm -hmm. it back on mm -hmm. it doesn't matter how long they are in my opinion so anyway um uh fast forward like you know 130 episodes but but after we did a couple i was like well that was fun what's for dinner you know and jared was like no fuck no think like a hundred of these you know and i'm like what it was a bit daunting but now that we're way past a hundred of them it's like duh i get it i get it this is going to be ongoing and ongoing and ongoing we are um you can find us talklouderpodcast.com. Uh, links to all our episodes are there, or there, there's links to, you know, if you like Apple, YouTube, uh, Spotify, whatever, uh, it's all on there. You can buy merchandise as well. Uh, we are doing this thing called Rock and Pod in Nashville, yeah. uh, mm -hmm. March 17th through 19th at the uh, Nashville Expo. And it's basically, uh, like a South by Southwest conference, but for music related podcasts, there'll be artists there that they assign, they have a liaison there that sets up all of our interviews and we have a booth and we, they come by and we interview them on our own gear, but they also are going to schedule me and Dave getting up on the main stage and they'll have some artists, probably the bigger name artists will come up and that will be filmed uh, as well. Uh, and then uh, they'll give us like a, you know, those will be we'll be able to use all the material that we that we recorded at uh, the Rock and Pod uh, Expo. Uh, we'll be able to edit that and put on our show, put on our roster. So it's kind of it's kind of cool. Uh, very very much looking forward to it. But you know, they're going to have Mark Weiss there, Eddie Ojeda is going to be there, uh, Ron Keel is going to be there. It's it's fun, and it's Nashville, so uh, mm -hmm. like four dudes from except live in nashville so i'm hoping that they'll come by and have nice dinner. very cool yeah. very cool so less cash is uh, king qu uh, question for you guys i know you probably get to ask this a lot um any any talk or thought about playing a show here that obviously you're not going to tour but there are you know there's some festivals there's good ones down in texas and austin they got a ripple fest that's really cool down there you got psycho fest in vegas maryland doom fest Desert Fest in New York City this past year. Any talk of maybe doing a show? And then if you do, I mean, is there, do you think there's any, I guess, you know, instead of just obviously other than getting together and playing these songs and having fans listen to them, do you think there's really any, I guess, benefit to, to doing any shows these days? Like Good that? question. Well, yeah, there's certainly be a benefit if it's one of those festivals you mentioned, then uh, they would have to ask us to do it, and we would probably try and figure out a way to do it. But, you know, we were talking about this last night. Uh, you got three of us in Jersey, one guy in Texas. Mm -hmm. But on top of that, I would feel a little bit naked going on stage without a second guitar player for Cassius King. So that would okay. add Scott LePage to the mix, which I would love. But, uh, you know, it's not cheap to fly five guys somewhere in hotels. And sure. we talked about this last night. We don't. We don't need to even make money, but we need to probably come close to breaking even. But it would certainly be exhilarating and be fun. I, we'd be all be all of us would be up for it. Yeah, and and we would have to do this thing. What? Wait a minute. What's that? Th oh yeah, rehearse. Yeah, because <laughs> yeah. we we're not yeah. really uh, sure. you know worked up uh, you know to to do that. the The machine is the machine right now is is able to write songs and record and 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 we're we're extremely pr proud of that uh obviously the outcome is fantastic and the response has been well but the uh the idea of playing live sound sounds incredibly fun uh but yeah there's not there's no way for us to break even logistically there's no breaking mm -hmm. even uh but i like the first thing dan said they would have to want us on they would have to 
know the material and go, wow, these would be guys would be good for the blah, blah stage at this mm-hmm. festival, da, 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 da. And, and we would have to be um, invited. I don't want to like beg to be on a festival and just be like a little dot in the corner. Sure. Um, Makes sense. I think mm-hmm. that it would respectfully, I would want them to know that, that we would be a good or feel that strongly that we would be a good fit and for them to ask us i don't i don't want to be one of these projects that like all right our music sort of fits in this box so that's where we need to go and we need to call them and just like really scratch at their door and beg and and bleed Mm -hmm. say please and all yeah i understand i don't i don't think that that's a thing but i love it that you think that we are worthy so thank you matt Oh, more than worthy. That's uh, you know, considering both of your guys' history and just as well as these last two records, I'm sure you'd be right at the top of that. Uh, if you did get invited, you, you you wouldn't be that little blip. I'll just say that you know, you guys would definitely be near the top of that uh, that list of the top bands playing at the show. But for those in the meantime, go ahead, pick up a copy of the new record, Dread the Dawn, Cash is King. It's out now on Nomad Eel Records in the U.S. and MDD Records in Europe. Guys, go ahead and let the viewers and listeners know where they can pick up the record, uh, and just keep up really what's you know with the band in general and, and just anything you guys got coming out, including singles. I know that you've put out over the over the last few years as well uh, with Nomad Eel. Well, um, if you go to a record store and they don't have our CD, if you can find a record store where you live, you can certainly get them to order it through all the normal distribution channels. Whether you're in America or Europe, in Europe there's actually stores that already have it without you asking. Mm -hmm. um also check out there's a big feature on cassius king in the next issue of decibel magazine i was honored to do an interview about the new cassius king album that's coming out around christmas time and the instagram cassius king band i'm dan lorenzo.net and jason and i we used to be talking about jason was talking a lot about pen pals now will be your email pal if you want to have a hit us up we'll probably respond within a few hours for a week very cool. All right. Once again, Cassius King, Dread the Dawn, record out now. And Dan, Jason, again, thank you both for coming on. And you know, good luck with everything. And we'll thank you. Can't wait to see here hear more Cassius King in the future as well. Thanks, Matt. Thanks, Matt. All right. Have a thank great you. night.